Black people winning in the game of life, dominating on their own terms. When someone tells you, I was gonna kill myself, and I was listening to you sing, and I decided to, decided to live. I mm. said, God, don't ever let me minimize the power of this gift ever again. Stories of black excellence told by today's most influential voices. I always tell people they're not paying for Tabitha Brown, because I'm not for sale. You're paying to partner with me. I'm your host, Torre. Welcome to Masters of the Game. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Great. Good. You grew up in your uncle's church. Yes. Singing every Sunday, almost <laughs> every day. All the time. How did that church experience develop you as a singer? Oh, man, Evangelistic Church of God in Christ is definitely the part of the reason I'm successful. Um, the pushing, the nurturing, the constant singing in the various conditions, good microphones, bad microphones, knowing the song, not knowing the song, not feeling well singing anyway. Um, a God movement, movement happening in church, and it goes on for a long time, and you sing the whole time because the song is a part of the power, the faith confession, the, you know, the exalting God, glorifying God. And so you literally have to learn. I can't say the same thing over and over, so you learn to ad lib. Mm. So church does all these things. And my mom was also a stickler for, like, movement. So when I was still very shy, I'd be standing behind the pulpit, and my mom would be in the back of the church going like this. That means that's all I can see. So I'd walk just on the side of the pulpit and be singing my song, just rocking back, back to back. And then she'd do like this. That means walk. <laughs> and she would say, if you're talking about God is great, she was like, you point to God and you say God is great. Like, my mom's so sassy, but I learned all that watching her in church and her teaching me. What did mom teach you about the voice? I don't know that there were particular, specific lessons about the voice. I just watched her do it. I watched her have nine children and be on the piano, always singing. We were always at church. Um, whether we had a good car or a raggedy car, somehow we were always there, you know what I mean? You know, financially struggling, but church and Jesus and God and music was the constant. So I would see her learn songs at home to prepare for choir rehearsal. She started asking me to help pick out parts as a young girl. So she'd go, this is the soprano part, what's the alto part? And I'd have to pick it out and then sing it with her. She's like, okay, good. So when she'd go to rehearsal, she'd teach the parts, but I'd be at home helping her pick up the part, so it developed my musical ear to find the right note. But part of what you get singing in church all the time is you are learning how to relate to an audience. Oh, yeah. And a lot of people grow up mm -hmm. singing in the bedroom, singing for a couple people. Or now on the phone, the laptop. Right, right. You're singing in front of mm -hmm. 100, 300, 500 people mm -hmm. who want to react to you, mm -hmm. right? So you're learning, like, when I do this, this happens. When I do... Yeah. Right? And that prepares you for being a professional singer. Yeah, you have lots of faces. You are the main person that don't want to be there, so they're sitting like this the whole time, no matter how good you sing. And you have to learn that I'm not just singing for them. I'm giving this gift to them, but it is to God. So whether they respond or clap, I've got to give it everything I got. And I can't get mad at them because they didn't make me feel good about what I did. So uh -huh. you're learning how to relate to an audience, and that is critical yeah. when you become a professional. So some people are happy for you. Some people are cheering. Go ahead, baby. Sing, baby. But if it's not so good, that's all right. Bless her heart. All right, Jesus. <laughs> if you mess up the words or the notes wrong, like, church shade is cold-blooded, but it teaches you to, you still have to stand there and sing the song. You can't run off crying. I did do that one time, and I stopped singing for my a lot of teenage years. You ran off crying? Because I couldn't remember the words. I didn't run off crying. I just couldn't remember the words, and so I put the mic down and walked off stage. I cried when I got in the back. And you stopped singing for a couple for, of years? So mm -hmm. from, like, 13, I want to say, to at least 16, 17, I didn't do no solos. Wow. How'd you get back out there? <laughs> My mama made me. <laughs> My mama said, OK, it's time to sing now. 
Let's go. And our choir was developing, and we had become a recording choir, evangelistic mass choir. Because and... you're already feeling professional because oh, yeah, you're yeah, doing feel... so much. You're singing around the world. You're singing around the city. And yeah. So you're feeling professional as a teenager. Yeah. So we did the McDonald Gospel Fest, and we won first place, and I was the lead singer for that. And we recorded, and I you know, had three songs on it. Don't find it and don't listen to it, OK? <laughs> I've grown. Um, <laughs> but in those times, I feel like, yeah, I'm, I'm professional. We said that in, in choir rehearsal all the time. What are we? Professional. And so I believed it. You said the conditions under which you develop mm -hmm. shape the kind of singer you become. For sure. So how does that relate to you? The conditions. So sometimes it is a, a dry moment in church. You know what I mean? Like maybe offering or announcements just happened, and so they just kind of there. And you have to literally bring the presence and all that back into the service. Or sometimes the presence is of God is high. I can't get up insecure or wondering or questioning. So you always want to have somebody that gets up that can handle the moment, right? So if you need to exhort, if the praise starts, you need to know what to do. You can't have the... I just started singing yesterday. Like, we're going to put you on Wednesday night when it's not, you're not singing on Sunday morning because you're not ready yet. Mm. But all of that is development. You know what I mean? And you know the moment you get there. Like, I grew up being fully supported. Like, the amens came. But some people are doing this to show off their talent. So it's an ego gesture. So oh. maybe they'll get nervous because mm -hmm. what if they reject me? Mm -hmm. You are going out with a sense of purpose. God wants me to do this, right? So it's bigger than you, mm -hmm. right? So does that help propel you as far as I, I, I am a vessel for God, let's go? I don't think I could articulate it that way. I don't even think that's what I, I just know I'm a singer and I sing in church and I'm presenting this to God. I didn't think God gave me a gift and he has endowed me with, I just, I didn't, I was like, I was, I was very insecure, like extremely. I'd be terrified, but I'd do it anyway. And sometimes when they, because I was insecure, they would give me compliments and I'd say, that's because they love me. How did you do it when you were terrified? Because I couldn't say I'm terrified and I'm not going to do it. My mom said, you better get your behind because up there and sing. Because you're an Atkins. Because I'm an Atkins. You better get your behind up there and sing. This is what we do. This is what we do, yeah. And I knew I had talent. I knew I could sing. I loved singing. I would sing. Me and Tina would both do this as kids. Like, we'd have a tape player, and we'd sit, like, behind something and sing and mimic all the runs and do all the things. But if my mama heard me, I knew I was going to have to sing in church. So I wanted to practice and sing, but I didn't want her here to hear too much. And she's going to put me on the spot. But when you and Tina sing together mm -hmm. in church, that mm -hmm. is an aha moment for you. Like, oh, we mesh yeah. really well. So the first time me and Tina sing in church is... Our choir's at a, a guest church, and we are up to sing. She usually sings with her best friend, Erica Bell. Erica wasn't there that particular Sunday, so I sang the song with Tina. And it goes over really well. This is our first time really doing this. And so um, after we sang, we're both kind of like, that was kind of cool. But we didn't, like, start practicing solos together. We didn't start doing any of that. We start writing songs. And at this time, we're just still saying, we made, I made up a song. So fast forward, we meet Warren, and he's like, you guys should be a group. We're like, hmm, yeah. Well, what was it from the beginning about the mixture of the two of you vocally that made you say, oh, this is it? Um, I don't know. So we all sang. So my whole family sang background for Dr. Bobby Jones, Bobby Jones Gospel, you know, oh, longest running show legend. that was on BET. And so he had my family singing background, and he's like, I'm going to have the Atkins as my singers. But none of them ever wanted to rehearse. So me and Tina would be trying to get them to rehearse, and my sister Lisa would be doing something, and Google would be doing something. I'd be like, come on, y'all. So me and Tina, and then the other ones were kind of young, Elena, and they were just kind of too young. So me and Tina just, we just kind of started doing a thing. And you sang to your sister when she came home? I did. My first song, my mom said my first song was, baby, la, 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 baby, la, 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 when Tina came home. So that's amazing. it's always been there. So when you're making Shackles, mm -hmm. Praise You. Yes. What's the inspiration? And what helped you to see the path to the sound that would define Mary Mary? So we were doing a song for the Prince of Egypt soundtrack. And Warren had the track that was going. He's playing it. We, that's what we usually do, put it on a loop, uh, play the hook, and we'll create the hook. 
So we was He writing. made the beat. Yeah, always. He uh, does all our music. We work with other people, but it's mostly Warren. All the big songs is all Warren. So the track is on. We're kids. Um, 26. So teen is 23, uh, 24. Um, and so we're doing the track, and we're working on it. And Warren goes out, and he comes back in, and he's singing take the shackles off my feet so I can dance. So it's for the prince of Egypt, so it's the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. So it is about breaking free. It is about, you know, overcoming. And so he did the hook, and then we started with the, in the corners of my mind, and all that came. And then Tina went, everything that could go wrong, all went wrong at one time. And all those things just built the song, and I believe that this joy should make you dance. I don't want to serve a sad Jesus. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna be sad, but I, I love Precious Lord, but that ain't my jam. I mean, it's 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 more upbeat yeah. and urban yeah. and of the modern sound. I mean, because that's where we're from. I, you know, we live in the hood. We hear everything that's going on, so it it feeds you. It it becomes your musical education. It becomes your musical language, the things that you hear. So my gospel that I grew up on was super cool. You know, it was John P. Key. It was Kirk. It was the Winans. It was the Clark sisters who were all just a little bit edgy for their time. Mm -hmm. So it let me know that so it was you wanna okay. Be, you want to be like that? Oh, yeah. Edgy for your time. For my time. But I still wanted church girls like me to go, listen, we don't have to be boring. We fresh. What are you talking about? So the music needs to be fresh. The approach needs to be fresh. And this is your husband Warren's vision, sonically. Yes. yes. And you're like, I don't know. Yeah. And and how do you get from Warren saying, this is where we need mm -hmm. to go, and you going, I don't know. Where, where, how do you bridge that? So the reason it was OK, because we wrote the music and we knew what we were talking about. We knew our heart and intention was to give people Jesus. So mm -hmm. there's a scripture that says, one must be wise to win souls. Because you can't put out a song going, everybody going to hell, I said, they're not going to be like, oh, wait, hold up, that's too much. You know what I mean? You got to say, I got to get myself together because I got some place to go. And then they go, hmm, that's cool. I can dance in that. But I, do I want to go to heaven? It's a question. And so now I put the ball in your court. Do you want to? All right, let me tell you about Jesus a little bit. So that's how my father would do, but we wrap that in the music. But Warren's the same way. Like, he was at death row. He'd work with all these hip hop people and all these things, but he's a, a, a thousand percent church kid. So you bring the, all those sensibilities of growing up in the hood, growing up in LA, but having this incredible faith in your home. You know, seeing people on drugs, seeing people get shot, being scared to walk to school, but knowing that I've been protected by God my whole life. Mm. Let me tell them that. Let me put it in a song. I think one of my favorite compliments was I was in New York, <laughs> in Brooklyn. I was going to a store to get something. And this dude, I'm thinking, like, he's trying to hit on me. So he's like, hey, yo, you one of the marriage? I was like, yeah, so I'm walking fast. Like, you know, he said, hey, hey, I know you're doing your solo thing, but just let me tell you this. You and your sister are needed for Aww. people like me. He was like, I'm not really a church dude. But I love God and I love your music. And thank you for what you do. Oh, that meant everything to me. I love it when an older church lady gets it. She already knows Jesus. She good. But somebody that does not know that there's hope and help in God, and I can put it in a song, that at your lowest moment you can listen to this and it can literally change the way you think and give you courage and faith, man, that is an honor to do. And I know what he feels that man in Brooklyn, because I'm yeah. not a church guy, but yeah. I can listen to your music wow. and feel the uplift and like, she's talking to me more than some of the other more traditional gospel Absolutely. singers are, because you're giving it to me with a flavor that I'm like, oh, I can rock to this, I can yeah. dance to this, I, it's got a bop. But then she's talking about Jesus, she's talking, I mean, all your songs are upliftment, mm -hmm. positivity, oh. inspiration, you can do it. <laughs> uh, you know, you're always trying to, like, bring mm. me up. Well, it's because I'm always trying to bring me up. Mm. As inspirational and as motivational as I can be, I could be very cynical. Mm. I could be very doubtful. So you're talking to yourself? Yeah. I'm saying, you telling me God can make a way? Why are we still in this two-bedroom apartment with roaches and we can't eat? Why do you keep telling me God can heal? And my grandmother is sick my whole life. So I was struggling with my faith. I still believed, but what I was saying and singing didn't match up with what 
You know what I mean? Family members who, uh, I'm on crack, so I'm gonna come around and say, hey, cuz, can I have two, three dollars? Like, it just, it just didn't make sense, but that was because I was expect expecting faith to be perfect. It wasn't perfect in the Bible days. So I don't expect faith to, faith to be perfect now. I expect faith to help me in my humanity and my brokenness. The Bible is full of screw ups. And the Bible says, while we were yet in our sin, while I was jacked up, while I was saying, no, God, I'm not fooling with you. You still woke me up in the morning. You never took my gift. You allowed me to sing when I was literally questioning and doubting you. Mm. I'm in the back crying, and I have to go out and say I cried my last tear yesterday, and I'm pissed. But the faithfulness of God showed me that you can overcome, that you got to go through just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. We all have our troubles. What does it take to have the courage to put out music that challenges the sure. listeners? Because your sound, mm -hmm. and we're talking about it more as we go on, your sound is challenging, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's not the normal gospel sound that a lot of people expect. Mm -hmm. And you had the courage to say, this is where we're going. Um, a lot of my courage came from my husband's courage. Mm. Let's do this. It's like, they not gonna like this. You said that? Mm-hmm. So you were resistant to urban gospel when you were first receiving it. Yeah, because I'm like a super churchy girl. Yeah. But the beauty of it was my father was um, very much an outreach preacher. So all the little bad boys in the neighborhood, they loved my dad. He could minister to them. He could encourage them. He could challenge them. He had a, you know, he was in the hood, so he's got a, a bench with a bar, and so he's, out, he's lifting weights with them, and they're like, oh, Elder Atkins is so cool. So I'm watching him relate, but also showing them this is what a man of faith looks like. I'm cool, we can talk, we can relate. I've got these beautiful daughters. Don't talk to them, though. You know, there's all these things. <laughs> um, we would go to uh, prisons, the first, I, I remember singing at 12 years old, going to a prison with my dad. Wow. The roughest parks in LA. We would go and we would learn to speak their language. When they tell me, you don't understand, your life been perfect. Everybody needs Jesus. Mm -hmm. I don't care, there's not the perfect person that I don't need you because you're good. Like, I'm a mess up just like anybody else. Mm -hmm. I just know who I run to. So let me give you somebody to run to. Because mm -hmm. you're trying to do it on your own and there's this level of brokenness that you can't get past. And Jesus loves you as you are. Mm. Oh, but I messed up. He knew you were going to mess up. Here it is. Listen to this song. Let it encourage your heart. And let your faith grow slow. Grow slow. It's OK. But I learned that early on. And it, it helped me to get this courage, this confidence to do what I do. Whether I'm 100% or not, he's 1,000%. Mm. So if I'm at 72, he's going to make up the difference. Mm. If I'm at 50, he's going to make up the difference. In some ways, being in a group with your sister or your sibling mm -hmm. is great, <laughs> and in some ways it's more complicated. Yeah. How has it been great and complicated? Uh, it's, it's all of that. It's good and bad, <laughs> wonderful and awful, <laughs> terrible and fantastic, all at the same time. Because I can fuss with her, but nobody loves me like her. Mm -hmm. So she's going to look out for me differently. We're not in competition with each other. It's so funny when people say, well, who leads the mouth? So we like, we both do. It's like, mm -hmm. no, but there has to be a lead. Like, mm -hmm. no, it's both of us, which was very empowering for both of us, but also um, very challenging when we stopped doing it together. But it was necessary because when we were together, it was just, it was, we just needed a shift because sometimes we would be too much sister and not enough group member, you know? Um, kind of disregard and disrespect for each other, mm. you know, and then get on stage and sing, but never deal with that. Mm. You know, we did that a lot of years. Oh, it'll be all right. We're not going to address it. We're not going to talk about it. We're not going to, we're just going to get another invitation and go sing and then laugh about something, but never learning to apologize. I think what has been so, so beautiful is learning to honor Tina and her honoring me. Mm. And realizing all that she brought and all that I brought and how both of those things is what made it work. But it also, I think, made it made us better sisters with other sisters, with our other sisters being honest about what we liked and what we didn't like. Cause you know when you grow up a big family, big families can insult you, can hurt your feelings, and you just gotta get over it. But some people, it hurts so bad, I'm not coming to Thanksgiving or Christmas or your birthday because I just don't think you like me. And sometimes the harsh words, they're, 
I, I want to say they're coming from a not a bad place, but they don't realize you're doing damage. Mm -hmm. You're saying this thing to this person that they are fighting with everything that they have within them, and you keep calling them that, and they don't want to be that. One of the things that I loved when we were doing the reality show, we met these two sisters. They were in their 60s, like I think like 65 and 68, and they hadn't spoken to each other in years. They both separately were watching the Mary Mary show. It was an episode where me and Tina went to therapy, and she was saying, we've always been like this, and we, I've always done this. And I was like, yeah, but I don't like it anymore. And I don't want you to do that anymore. And we just kind of looked at each other, and we were like, OK. Those sisters happened to be at a venue, and they said, we called each other after that episode. Then we started watching the show together. Mm. And we mended our relationship, because we watched y'all go to therapy in front of the world. Thank you for being vulnerable, to share your pain and your struggle as sisters, as business partners in front of the world. There's all these ways that you have affected other people's lives <sighs> with the things that you do. Man. It's beautiful to know that my pain or my struggle or my question can bring somebody else healing. My mom would say, you're not going through this for nothing, baby. It's going to matter one day. Mm. You know, heartbreak, disappointments, boyfriend stuff, you know, trouble with friends, losing friends. She'll say, you're not going through this for nothing, baby. It's mm. going to matter one day. Mm. And so when I can use that story to encourage somebody who is hurt like I've hurt, and all they see is the inspiration, and they don't know that I had to fight for that, somebody's testimony tells me it was worth it. You grew a little bit, and now you're helping somebody else grow. So it is just, it's amazing. And I, I try to tell people, it's not going to make sense right now. My uncle would always say, just keep living, baby. I hated that answer. At 22, there's certain things you're just not going to understand. Sometimes at 32, there's things you're not going to have to understand. Keep living, baby. They would say that, just keep living, baby. You know what I mean? Marriage stuff, kids stuff, trying to understand the industry. Your journey has been so much more than making hit records and making a TV show. Yeah. It has been about getting people to have faith, have hope, yes. change their lives. Yes. And that is so much more than having entertainment success. Absolutely. But it's so valuable. You know what I mean? Because I, I get to help people grow and be better. Like, that's a great job to have. It comes with a big weight because sometimes you don't feel, I don't feel equipped or I don't feel like I have enough. Um, and just when I become empty, there's a scripture that says, when I am weak, then he is strong. Mm. So where I meet my end, I go, okay, God, I don't, they put me on this panel with all these doctors and all these people. What the heck am I doing here? You're is, like, I got you. Is it that you need to sing and this is what you love to sing about? Or you need to spread the word of God, mm -hmm. and this is the way you can do it. That is an amazing, wonderful question. And I think it's a, a beautiful combination of both. I need to sing. Like, I, I have to sing, like, for my life, for my survival. Um, songs heal me and help me. Um, but the fact that I get to do it about a creator that I'm still learning and knowing and experiencing, and I get to share these messages with people that allow them to be open to, OK, what does my relationship with God mean? Am I just trying to get to heaven? Am I just trying to avoid hell? Am I just trying to get, you know, make sure I don't get sick? Like, what am I really getting out of this? But like a literal relationship with the creator of the universe. Like, you created stars and whales and mm. trees and forests and their organized systems and science and mind. And, and you want to know me? I'm never going to understand you, but I'll spend my life trying to get to know you and telling other people of who you are. Mm. What time do you wake up? My day starts either at 2.30 or 3.30. PM? AM. What? On the West Coast. I do Get Up Mornings with Erica Campbell, and it is live from 3 to 7 AM. But if I was in the Midwest, it'd be 5 to 9. On the East Coast, it's 6 to 10. So you wake up at 2.30 mm -hmm. to be ready to go at 3. At 3. 
mic set up, camera set up. I do a prayer. I have to print out my things, make sure my Wi-Fi is connected, all the things. What time do you go to bed? Should be six or seven. Ricky Smiley told me when I first started, he said, Erica, go to bed at seven. I was like, seven o'clock? A toddler bedtime? So I didn't do it, and I was like, ooh, it was bad the first. <laughs> ooh, so bad. I was tired. Um, but you have to deliver and be on and present and laughing. So um, I started, you know, making myself get rest. In the morning the show, mm -hmm. there's the singing career. There's three children mm -hmm. plus family, yeah. huge family. Church. At church. First lady. <sighs> How do you do it? One day at a time, one moment at a time. Um, I'm not holding a microphone and a fork to cook at the same time. <laughs> so. But almost. You know. <laughs> no, a great support system, a great family. I always say I have the husband I need and the family that I need for the career that God gave me. Mm. So we're all kind of in this together. And um, I think that's what makes it work. My husband's so supportive. What is the secular music that you're like, we want to be a little bit like that. We're going to keep it. <laughs> We're gonna keep it Jesus and gospel, yeah. but I like their sound. Oh, there was so much that I loved from, you know, Atlantic Star. Well, so my brother loved Always and Forever. Of he course. listened to it my whole life. We were like, who are you in love with, bro? Turn this off. But you hear this soulful music. You know, my Aunt Vera loved Shalimar. Mm -hmm. A-track, dating myself, right? Mm -hmm. And so I hear all this music. <laughs> I hear Stephanie Mills. Mm -hmm. I hear, you know, the Jacksons. I hear all these things, and it's like, ooh. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But it wasn't like I felt like this is better than what I do, because this is my world. I shine here. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I, I was never that gospel artist that felt like I was second rate or a little less than or not as cool mm -hmm. as somebody else because I sang gospel. Never felt less than. Never mm -hmm. felt second rate. I Love God is another song <laughs> that really touches me as a non-churchy mm -hmm. uh, person who mm -hmm. I'm like, ooh, like I can feel this message. Because yeah. again, you're breaking out of gospel sonic sort of traditions yeah. and you're giving me the gospel message mm -hmm. right but like you're doing it in a way that we could transpose that song it could be you know For anybody could sing yeah, it yeah yeah i don't think we, i don't think i have to be safe as an artist mm -hmm. i don't think i have to do what's comfortable for people i don't i don't mind making them a little uncomfortable. See, now that's, 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 that, that's the area where you are, right? <laughs> that sometimes your gospel makes some people in the gospel world mm -hmm. uncomfortable. You're bringing in the brother in Brooklyn who's like, I don't go to church, but I feel I'm you. Like, yeah. But then the sister in church, who's in church every Sunday and Wednesday and Thursday, is mm -hmm. like, what are you doing, Erica? Yeah. Right, so how do, you, how do you balance that within you? I think when you grow up hearing, they're not gonna like that, they won't like that, I started saying, who are they and why did we give them, why do we give them so much power? Mm. Am I living for them or God? Am I trying to serve him? Am I trying to reach people in different places, of different cultures, of different lifestyles? Or I'm just trying to make sure that y'all happy? So then I can't get to the best version of myself because I just made you my God. You know? Wow. And because I loved my church upbringing, it hurt to hear that there were whole churches saying, don't you buy that mess, don't you play that mess. My church, me and Tina sang at a church in Atlanta. They invited us. And I think God allows me to get selective amnesia because I don't remember the name of the church or the pastor. Um, we go, we sing at this church, they invite us. And when we sit down on the front row, the first two seats on the front row, the pastor gets up and says, well, that was cute. <gasps> Where's my singer? <gasps> Is my singer gonna sing? And the you could, shade! He sucked the air out of the room and we sat there. Yeah. And smiled. And sat a little taller. And then went on to sell so platinum and won Grammys. But, but how are you feeling that. in that moment? <sighs> Hurt, offended, but also that I'm great, he just don't know it. I'm just not his preference and that's okay. I'm great, he don't know it. He don't know it, he can't see it, it's okay. He's not caught up yet. Oh yeah, he don't know. That's okay. I'm all the things, he'll get there one day, you'll see. Do you say something to him after the service? Never. About, what, 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 what was that? Never, for what? That's how he feels, I'm not gonna change his mind. 
And it's not going to change what he did in front of the whole church. So, mm. I haven't. I don't, mm. I, haven't, I do not chase gossip. I do not believe in changing somebody. Listen, if you don't like me, you go find other people. Y'all have a party, paint a picture, talk about me. I'm not coming. If I listen to all your songs, <laughs> Mary Mary and Solo, mm -hmm. what would be the big message? What would be the big takeaway? Mm. That's a great question. There's a lot of big takeaways in the songs. Um, sometimes it's love. That's what I'm on these days. I, I love you record, loving me, loving the people, loving God, um, and what love does. Sometimes it's fighting. Sometimes it's I'm trying to break free. Mm. It depends on the season that I've been in in my life. Um, my music always comes from a real place. It always hits me in the face first. Mm. So can't give up now. I've had to sing that with tears in my eyes. Mm, wow. um, in the morning, you'll be all right. I've had to sing that song when I didn't think I was going to be all right, but I just kept singing it. The song Positive or Feel All Right was smack dab in the pandemic. When you don't, don't say positive, everybody's going to run away from you. But mm. I was like, I believe this word still has power. So most of my music has been for me first. So that's why I can always sing it and talk about it with conviction and passion because I've been there. I know what it feels like to be the opposite of that. Let's hand out some advice, because you've mastered a lot of things that people want to master. So let's give them some advice. If someone mm. wants to be a great singer, what is your advice? A great singer? Be honest about the level of your gifting. Mm. There are a lot of people who want it, but the level of their gifting isn't where it needs to be. I won't say they can't sing, because some people literally can learn and have unique gifts. There are some people who can't. There's Plenty of professional singers who aren't that good <laughs> and are successful. Right. But they have something authentic mm -hmm. that is true to who they are. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And how they give it and people like it. You have to be sure about what it is you want. If you're doing, if you want to sing because you want people to like you, pick another career. Mm, Sell ice cream. Why? Because they're not always going to like the song or you or your performance. You know what I mean? I've had songs that I felt were great. And radio would tell me, no, nah, it just didn't test well. I mean, most of your songs are not going to be hits. Uh, yeah. You're, you're lucky if 10% of the songs are hits. So my advice to the singer is be sure about what you want to do. Learn the business. Know that it's difficult. And that the hills and the valleys are both involved in this career. Mm. Don't, discount, don't discount the valley, but don't put too much on the mountain because you won't stay there forever. Enjoy it while you're there, but life is this. If you learn to exist in this, then the music and the career won't suck you dry. So if someone wants to be a great gospel singer, what is your advice? So you have to do all that other stuff too, but you also have to really love God and the gospel and find out what that means. What is your part of the assignment? Because people are, you know, there are people who sing worship, there are people who do Christian hip hop, jazz, so many different styles and genres. Find out what your assignment is and what you're called to, what's true to you, not just what you think is dope. Mm -hmm. So I remember me and Tina being on the side of the stage and Fred Hammond went on, he's killing it. We're like, oh, maybe we should do a little bit more of that. Then Yolanda goes on, we're like, oh, mm. okay, maybe a little bit more than that. And then the wine is going, and like everybody, Kirk, and so we're like, oh, maybe we should do a little bit more than that. And I remember, hearing in my soul, I gave you what you need to be all that you need. Mm. And so I was like, I don't have to be them. I'm actually here on this same program. I was invited too, to sing my song and while well, they sang their song. I sang, uh, the first time I was going solo, Tina was having a baby and it was um, a night of stars, and they were honoring Lionel Richie, and they opened with We Are the World. Mm. It's Stevie Wonder. Mm -mm. It's James Ingram. Mm -mm. And Natalie Cole. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. And me. Mm -hmm. And I'm in sound check, but it's surreal, and I'm like freaking out, like they're gonna cut me any moment. They only got me because somebody else is not available. And right before the curtain goes up, Stevie's on piano, Natalie Cole's to my right, James Ingram to my left, he taps me and he says, you're supposed to be here. Mm. It's like, it's not an accident. Oh, that gave me so much. 
because I could fully be myself. I wasn't in the capacity of singing as a gospel artist, but when you know who you are, you stand in different spaces and you're effective. With the next album, how have you grown and changed as a singer, songwriter, creator? Ah. Oh. Um, this album has just, it's so special. Like, it's, it's so much growth in me. It's your favorite of yours. This I Love You record is my favorite. Yeah, my husband, I heard him talking about the record, and he said she sounds the best she's ever sounded, and hers is my favorite voice. Oh, I'm that guy. <laughs> but it still was a really great compliment, because he's worked with everybody. Yeah. Yeah, he works with some phenomenal young singers who are, I know that they will be legendary. I know they're gonna make impact and be here for a long time. So to hear him still say things like that is super encouraging. And sometimes I'm in wife mode, but sometimes I become an artist that goes, he's proud, you know? So um, this record has allowed me to see myself in ways that I didn't before, sing songs that are very honest and true to me and allow me to share that honesty with other people, it is my I love you record, because I really do. I say this on my radio show, I love you and I mean it. And people are like, you don't even know me. I was like, the same way I'll see a stranger on social media and see a post about them and their family and be like, I love that. That's my wish for people. Like, I hope you feel loved and seen and valued. I hope you have hope. I, I don't have to know you to want that for you. And so I just want to make a love deposit. And that's what I hope this record does in, in small ways. And, a love deposit for different people to see it through different eyes, not through a broken relationship, not through a broken family, not through your hopelessness, but see love through the eyes of God who sees you just as you are and thinks that you're absolutely beautiful and amazing and wonderful. You know, you were asking about practicing and, and how often I practice. For a lot of years, I didn't because the church kind of trains you and you kind of do it, but my husband will be on my head he was like, can you imagine what kind of singer you would be if you practiced every week and not just two days before a big show? I don't care if it's the Grammys, uh, the Stellar Awards, a tour. He was like, y'all gave it two days. Like, what's wrong with y'all? And your husband was like, you need to get oh, in the gym and practice, practice, practice. Absolutely. So now, do you have a vocal coach? I do. Rob Stevenson has blessed my life. I've had a few, but he's been... Uh, just a, it's been a, a big shift with him in my life. What has a vocal coach, I mean, you are a professional, mm -hmm. super successful singer for mm -hmm. a long time. Mm -hmm. What has your vocal coach given you, taught you, shown you that you didn't already know? Breathing, air control, volume, um, building the muscle of the voice, knowing that my body is the instrument. And when he first told me, when you have to sing, I want you to get up two hours before, I want you to do 30 minutes of cardio. I want you to do 40, mi 40 minutes of vocalizing. I want you to have at least a uh, half a gallon of water before you sing. I was like, ain't nobody getting up that early. If I have to sing at 6, I'm up at 5, I'm there at 5.30, and I'm going to sing. And he said, but you are not using your voice to the fullest capacity. So this is helping you, what, be more intentional Absolutely. with your gift? Absolutely. And I am more in love with my voice than I have ever been in my entire life. This is this new I Love You record is the only record that I have listened to this much and not cringed and said, oh, she did that. Oh, so you are better at singing now than you have ever been. Absolutely. Because taking the whole body, the whole throat more seriously. It's like if somebody gives you an amazing gift and you sit it on the counter and you get it every now and again. It's a gift, you like it every now and again. But if someone gives you something special and you put it in a special place in your house and there's a light over it because it is special and it's no one else has this, just me, it's, it's individual, it was designed for me with my name on it, and you treat it that way, this gift is always there and that gift actually gives back to you. Mm. So when I started treating my voice like that, a lot of this is maturity and growth and mm -hmm. the things that I had been afraid of for years never happened. And so we like, okay, let's just throw the fears away. What do we need them for? Sometimes they help you. Sometimes they push you and make you better. Um, but when you learn that your gift is truly a gift, when someone tells you, I was going to kill myself, and I was listening to you sing, and I decided to, decided to live, mm. I said, God, don't ever let me minimize the power of this gift ever again.
Mm. Don't ever let me get on stage and wait for them to clap before I appreciate what you've given me. Mm. Because you don't always see the immediate result of what you do. I remember singing on stage and, uh, you know, sometimes me and Tina would go down and shake hands. If we didn't have an official meet and greet, this couple comes up and they said, this was our last event together. We were getting a divorce after this. We got the papers at home. But y'all singing tonight helped us say, we're going to try. We're going to hold on. We're going to put Jesus at the center. How can I di disregard or minimize that gift because maybe a note wasn't right or my voice cracked? So I did that for many years. You know what I mean? When I first started becoming solo, I was still doing Mary Mary. I had just had my daughter. She was only one years old. We were doing the Mary Mary show. My husband had started a church, and I had just started the radio show. I was a crazy person. And my voice just couldn't hold up. I wasn't resting. I found out I had high blood pressure. It was all going to hell in a handbasket. And I was like, you think, this, this is this the end? Am I, am I done? My gift only works with Tina. It don't work by itself. So my gift is flawed. Hmm. Um, but I had to learn that I wasn't being a good steward over my time, my body, my mind. So my body couldn't give it, couldn't give what it needed to because I just wouldn't be in good to the gift. I wasn't being good to myself. Mm, we have to honor our gifts. Honor the gift. Everybody can't do it. Yeah. And a lot of people, you know, low self-esteem or insecurity will tell you, oh, anybody can do this. It's not special. No, no. Oh, I just cooked a meal. You cooked a meal that blessed people's lives. Yeah. Oh, I just do hair. When they leave you, they feel better about yeah. who they are. Yeah. Having a conversation with someone that makes them think and feel and stand tall, it's a gift. Everybody can't do this. Yeah. When you appreciate the gift, the gift gives back to you.